Hello, my name is David Tinkelman, and I'm professor of pediatrics at National Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado. Today we're going to talk about addressing rhinitis symptoms using a process of effective diagnosis and management. National Jewish Health was established in 1899 and since 1998 has been the number one respiratory center in the United States by U.S. News and World Report. What we're going to talk about today is a patient who presents to your office with rhinitis. To start with, what do we need to know? A good history is essential. First of all, find out what are the symptoms and how severe are they? When do they occur? Do they occur all during the day? Do they occur in the morning? Do they occur in the evening? Are they seasonal or are they perennial in nature? Lastly, try to find out where the symptoms occur. Is there a relationship to being inside, outside, or are they work-related? If you think about the history, it will tell you a lot of information about the more common respiratory inhalant allergens that are out there. First of all, symptoms may occur all year round. They still may be non-allergic, as many people have a condition that's called vasomotor rhinitis, which is a nonspecific inflammation of the lining of the nose. However, they may be allergic with exposure to specific perennial allergens. These may be animals that live in the home. They may be the dust mite or cockroach, or they may be molds, which can occur any time of the year, but especially in the fall. Some people have symptoms that are predominantly seasonal, but they still may be non-allergic. There are individuals who have symptoms during the fall and winter months, and they may be related to infections or to inflammation that is exacerbated by the cold of the fall and winter months. Or they may be allergic. During the spring, this may be due to the trees and grasses. In the summer, it may be due to the grasses and the weeds. And in the fall, it may be due to the weeds and the molds. What do we see in the office? What I'd like to do is present a case of a 50-year-old woman who presents with typical symptoms of rhinoconjunctivitis. She tells you that her symptoms have been for years, although some years are worse than others. Basically, her symptoms are mild throughout most of the year, and her real problem is in the late fall and summer months. Her symptoms can occur both inside and out, but are worse when she has been outside for hours, which occurs mostly on the weekends. She'll tell you about her nasal congestion, which wakes her up at night and bothers her during the day as well. Her sneezing is embarrassing at work and socially. Her eyes burn and itch, mainly for two to three weeks in the spring and a little bit in the fall. The rest of her past medical history is essentially unremarkable. She lives in a home that has forced air heat, but she will tell you about her two cats, although neither sleep in the bedroom. She lives in a wooded suburban area, and her windows can be open during the spring and fall months. She has used a variety of medications, mainly they have been over-the-counter and antihistamines. She has used eye drops on an occasional basis. Her physical examination is basically normal, except for the examination of her upper airways. When you look at her eyes, you'll see that there is mild, diffuse, bilateral conjunctival erythema. And when you look in her nose, there's moderate nasal swelling and erythema bilaterally. Her lungs are normal and her skin is normal. What do we do now and why? It's important to make the diagnosis beyond simply calling this patient as having rhinitis. We need to find out whether it is on an allergic or non-allergic basis. This will help us to not only establish a treatment plan, but also to establish what we can do to avoid the symptoms in the future. How do we do this? We want to use either in vivo or in vitro testing to determine whether or not this person is allergic. And what we'll do in this particular case is show you some in vitro testing. Again, you may ask, why is it important to differentiate allergic versus a non-allergic etiology? In this particular slide, you will see that we often make a mistake on whether or not this person has allergic or a non-allergic condition. On the next slide, I'm going to show you two different situations that may occur in your office. Both of these, as you see in the second column, present with a very similar history. But if you go on and perform the appropriate evaluation of allergy, when you find out the individual is non-allergic, it's a totally different approach, especially for prevention. When we find out if this individual is in fact allergic, then we want not only to treat the symptoms, but what can we do to avoid the situation that causes the symptoms to occur. In this particular patient, we performed a battery of in vitro testing. On this list, you will see the results of that testing. I like to divide this into different categories. 
First of all, the total IgE. In this particular patient, it is 200, which indicates that this patient is an allergic individual. Then we look at the perennial allergens, the dust mite and the cat. Both of these are mildly elevated, which probably indicates why she has symptoms that are all year round. Then we'll separate this into both the spring and the fall allergens. There's some elevation in the spring, but not anywhere near as much as elevated in the fall, which is both to the weeds as well as to the mold. This is all consistent with the history which I've just described to you. Patients like to know the allergens to which they are allergic, and having a sheet which allows you to write down the specific allergens gives them something to take home and they can refer to once they're out of the office setting. For this particular patient, we can now get to a diagnosis. She has allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, which is predominantly seasonal in nature. Now, how do we approach the treatment? There are three ways to look at this. The first is allergen avoidance, the second is pharmacotherapy, and the third is what can we do to prevent the symptoms in the future? As far as allergen avoidance, what can we really do with an individual who has exposures to both indoor and outdoor allergens? For the outdoor allergens, there's not a lot you can do. But for the indoor allergens, this woman can do a lot. She can reduce her exposure to her cats. She can cover the mattress and cover the other items where there's dust mite. And she can reduce her exposure to the molds. For pharmacotherapy, I would suggest that this woman be treated with a nasal steroid spray during both the spring and fall months and using an antihistamine as a secondary PRN medication. Lastly, what can we do to reduce her symptoms next ragweed and mold season? Using an antihistamine and nasal steroids prior to the onset of the season will reduce this woman's symptoms significantly. Now let's see what happened to this particular patient. She reports that her symptoms are much better all throughout the year as well as during the fall, ragweed, and mold season. She hardly uses her eye drops and she hardly uses any antihistamines. You're going to see a lot of patients who present with rhinitis symptoms. With this information, we suggest that you have a process for effective diagnosis and management. Start with a good history, including a focus on allergy. What are the symptoms? How severe are they? When do they occur? Are they related to particular exposures? A good physical examination will let you know whether the inflammatory process is present at the time of the examination. Lastly, a measurement of the immunologic response is essential. If you're going to make an accurate diagnosis and go beyond the term of rhinitis to determine not only the diagnosis but how you're going to approach it, going ahead with either in vivo or in vitro testing is very important. In this particular case, we used in vitro testing. It's a very simple procedure that gives accurate results in a short period of time. Once you have this information, putting together the history, the physical examination, and the immunologic response, you can make an accurate diagnosis. Having an accurate diagnosis, you can then go forward with a specific plan of avoidance of exposures that may limit the amount of symptoms this individual will experience adding to that appropriate pharmacotherapy, and lastly, evaluating the effects of all these therapies to determine whether or not you've been able to control the symptoms. After you've done all this, you should be in a much better position to address the many patients who present to your office with rhinitis symptoms. This is a process that should give you effective diagnosis and management. Thank you.